What's up guys, welcome back to Newswave. Well, last week there was a story around Switch games seemingly disappearing, going out of stock, and then speculation around Nintendo Selects, and all of this caused quite the reaction online, so much so that I wanted to go back to it with some more information and really just go over what exactly is happening here and how the, the market itself is even being affected. Also, we are gonna be talking about a new announcement for the Nintendo 64, especially if you're someone who has a stick that's all messed up, but you don't wanna give up the, the stock feel of it. And we'll also be talking about Final Fantasy 17. While we're way off from it, it appears we're already getting some information from Yoshida about the direction, even some of the early planning for it. Guys, if you enjoy these videos, make sure you hit that like button. Helps out a ton. And if new here to the Spawn Wave channel, make sure you subscribe down below. And we're going to start today with Sony, the PlayStation 5, and that Insomniac leak, which has given us a ton of information, even just outside of Insomniac, but just Sony and PlayStation as a whole. In this case, there were some slides that go over playtime and where the user base is spending it with single player games, multiplayer, free to play. There are a lot of options and sectors to explore on PlayStation, but we know the thing that has really pulled people towards the PlayStation 5 system, or just PlayStation in general over the last decade plus, would be those single player narrative driven experiences. Well, I can't show you the slides necessarily, I can just show you some different trailers here of games like that, but the interesting thing about the slides that leaked it does show that a significant amount of people on the PlayStation 5 are indeed playing single player games, which is interesting that Sony would have such a large pivot behind the scenes towards these live service initiatives. We don't know how far into free to play or anything they had gone. We just know that they were going after the live service sector. And I, I guess just if they feel like if they can grow the other end of the spectrum for them with a single player side that's incredibly successful, they would be even more successful. But I mean, there's only so much time in the day. So they have to understand that cutting out or cutting into their single player stuff might end up being the overall reality with these live service games. But at least good to see the single player offline games. They're still extremely popular on PlayStation. We believe that will hopefully steer their decisions over the next 10 years or so for game development. Also for fans of Battlefield who maybe didn't enjoy the most recent Battlefield game, although it has gotten better over time, but one big criticism had to do with the lack of overall destruction with the different buildings, something that I think was super impressive, even now if you go back and play it, for Bad Company 2. But it appears maybe they could be exploring that again in the next entry, as we can see this job listing that was discovered, this by Tech 4 Gamers, it's for a, as you can see here, a VFX director saying we are looking for a senior 3D artist like you to help us create the most realistic and exciting destruction effects in the industry. Hmm. So I, I think that's something that could really set the next battlefield apart are just destructible environments, buildings, the whole thing. I mean, take that to the next level because that's still one of the most memorable moments from a first person shooter for me is being in a building and something like Bad Company 2 and it getting hit so much by tanks or even just people with like rocket launchers that the entire building would come down and just annihilate everyone in there who may have been camping. It was a really cool way to maneuver the map even exploding through walls anywhere. So I hope that is something that they have planned out maybe for the next battlefield. And I'm, I'm still trying to figure out when that would be. It seems like it could still be years and years off, but I like at least what I'm hearing from this one job listing. Here's hoping there's much more of that when we get towards its release. Oh, and we did get a really good humble bundle that popped up. This is for our awesome games done quick. And you can see the bundle here. This is $10 and it'll get you eight different games. So we have Bayonetta, Borderlands 2 Game of the Year, Celeste, Sprawl, Bloodstained Ritual of the Night, Astalon Tears of the Earth, and Sonic Adventure 2 and Sonic Adventure 2 Battle. Now this would be uh, accessible on Steam, so keep that in mind, but hey, if you have a, a Steam Deck or a ROG Ally or anything there, this would work perfectly for that, as basically all these games should work really well on there, especially the Steam Deck OLED. Fire up Bayonetta and push the frames up on, on that one with the higher refresh screen there or the ROG Ally. So pretty good bundle to look into, 10 bucks, get some pretty solid games. And guys, with some of the quick news out of the way, let's get into the bigger stuff. Let's start right away with the situation around the Nintendo and these Switch games that are disappearing, going out of stock, or even going out of print? Well, there, there is a bit more to the story, I feel, but we're at the wait, I think, for whatever it is, Nintendo selects, potentially, or just rebranding it for the next system that 
might just be 100% or 98% will say backwards compatible. Why not rebrand them with the Switch 2 logo so it all fits in nicely? But we, we can see this list. This was posted up by Nintendeal, who's been following along with this as they, of course, give stock alerts for different sales. It makes sense that they would be paying attention to just overall stock on places like Amazon. But the list that they've included, these are all games that seem to be coming up out of stock or just not available. So, I mean, you look at the list, that's pretty lengthy. I mean, Paper Mario, The Origami King, Metroid Dread, uh, Xenoblade Chronicles 2, although that has gone in and out of stock and, and seemingly print over and over again now. But the one that really caught me off guard, I feel like, was Fire Emblem Engage. That's not an old game, so it's, it'd be odd if that just all of a sudden disappeared from availability. But a lot of big first-party Nintendo games that continue to sell well, they're evergreen titles. Well, they did post this up alongside of it saying, I've seen this out-of-print Nintendo Switch games list floating around, but I think people are confusing out-of-print with not in stock on Amazon, as many of them are still available at multiple other retailers. That said, I do think there is something funky going on. And in fact, if you go to places like Walmart, Best Buy, Target, these games are in stock for the most. Like even I just went by my local Walmart and Best Buy over the last few days. You, the Switch section is still full of games. Uh, for how long at retail? Who really knows? Based on what's kind of happening behind the scenes at a place like Best Buy with their own physical media. But I also did look around somewhat on eBay, and there does appear to have been an attempt to push pricing up on some of these games, which can only tell me that, like, for example, Paper Mario, someone was trying to sell that for $100 or so, and they had several of them as they sold 12 or 13. Uh, Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze, Link's Awakening, Pikmin 3 Deluxe are all games that also seem to see a mild price bump over a couple of days, then it kind of settled down. So I, I do think that may have been a bit of FOMO or people getting really concerned that they're just going to miss these games being new or we'll say the original copy, right? If you get a Nintendo Selects, look, I know the pricing is lower, which is great, but you do get a really ugly looking banner at times on it that takes over quite a bit of the box art and I get flashes to like, like the GameCube games when those got re-released as like greatest hits. It's, it's not great, but still the games should be completely available. It would be very, very strange if Nintendo really moved off of something like Fire Emblem Engage or Mario Odyssey already when they're kind of in the, the twilight year of the Switch where they should be trying to sell as much software as possible. You have all the systems out there. This is when you try to move a bunch of those Switch cartridges that continue to turn in really good results every single fiscal quarter. But as I looked around a little further, retailers like Walmart, are actually discounting these games brand new. For example, Yoshi's Crafted World is $40 and many other first party Nintendo games, the same deal, they're marked down 20 bucks. So I don't know if I would run out and just start buying every single Switch game. I mean, you can if you want, obviously, but I don't think that should be the result of the potential for these games never coming back. There could be a number of things happening behind the scenes that we're just unaware of. And yeah, it could result in Nintendo Selects, but it could also result in these games just all of a sudden showing up again on places like Amazon or in retail stores where they're sold out. So don't don't get too crazy with it yet. We'll wait and see coming up what happens and then we'll deal with, I'm sure, all the scalpers on eBay. Looking at you, Mario 3D All-Stars. Next up, let's talk about the Nintendo 64 and an interesting new product, or I should say new replacement part. This would be the joystick in the controller, which we all know if you were over at a friend's house playing four players on things like Mario Party or Pokemon Stadium mini games, that joystick would go through it for all the different uh, uh, movements you would have to do. And they even had sent out gloves and stuff, but basically that joystick got beat up constantly. And it was very common for it to basically develop lean and never really play the same again. Well, you could replace it with a third party stick, but the quality was terrible. And most of the times it wouldn't even track correctly or as well as the stock one. And if you replaced it with the GameCube stick that was really cool at first, you would soon realize the travel wasn't correct there either. Well, that leads us here, which we can see this posted up over on Twitter. This is from Rocker Gaming, who says, Over the last year, I have taken a break from content creation on YouTube. I want to take a break and tackle a big problem in gaming, a problem that couldn't be easily solved without time, effort, and dedication. This is Project Renaissance and a Nintendo 64 project, which you can see it here. And this is, a, this is pretty impressive what they've really gotten into here for what's essentially a joystick in a controller, but... If you look at it now, compared to the joysticks we have currently, pretty unique, right? And in this case, it appears to be modular, so you can change out different 
parts in it. For example, they mention uh, the nib can be replaced with a 15 cent off the shelf component, the bowl insert being replaceable and use of threaded inserts to secure the parts. But it extends further because this is 2024, not 1994. We can take advantage of modern materials to make the parts even better. Now they go on to talk about the speed running scene, which uh, I mean, if you look at something even like Mario 64, I'm sure they would love to have these control sticks that uh, are much more reliable or just easy to access because there's only so many original Nintendo 64 controllers that have good sticks in them that are stock. Again, they just, they went through the ringer. It was very, very common. And if it's just a little off, you're trying to race against the clock for milliseconds at times, it's, it's not gonna work out. So I like the idea of one that gets as close to the original as possible. And the idea of being able to replace some of the different parts yourself so you can still keep that stick like in, in shape is great. So something to keep an eye on here as we go along, especially as they get closer to release and they're able to show it off in a uh, more, I, I guess, tangible context there outside of some of the drawings and ideas they've presented on Twitter. But I'll link down below for the thread if you wanna learn a bit more about it. Next up, let's talk about a game that I'm not really expecting until say 2030 or 2031 on the PlayStation 6, and that's Final Fantasy 17. We saw what happened here with 16 as it uh, definitely divided the fan base a bit with really just the play style for it, the singular character that was traveling around, it being more of an action Devil May Cry experience as opposed to even Final Fantasy VII Remake that's kind of a mixture between turn-based and action. Well, Naoki Yoshida did talk a bit about this in a recent podcast and some of their plans for the future with this new entry. And he did mention that they might go to a, a younger a uh, developer core who can work to create this with some more modernized features at that time, right? Always good to get new faces in who can maybe put their own spin on the series as the numbered Final Fantasies try to be different from one another if they can, whether it's a new, a new kind of twist on turn-based combat or just new ideas in general for leveling, progression, etc. Well, we can see this posted up. This is transcribed from that podcast where he says, and while I'm certainly not looking to pick a fight with the older games, we can make Final Fantasy games thinking mine will be the most fun. So my advice is just dive in and first put down on paper what you believe would be the most enjoyable Final Fantasy before thinking too hard about it. Then from there, you can think since 16 was real-time action, my Final Fantasy is going to have both real-time action and turn-based battles or... You go the other extreme and return it to its fully turn-based pixel art roots. Uh, to be honest, I don't know how that would work out with pixel art. I'm sure there are people out there right now who are like, oh, that'd be incredible. But let's face it, selling that to the mainstream? I mean, we're having a hard enough time getting a 2D game to sell in mass at full price to the mainstream. And it's pretty clear that uh, Square Enix dumps a lot of money along with Sony into these big Final Fantasy experiences. And then you take a step back to, well, what, again, the mainstream, but they step back to the pixel art. I, I think it'd be kind of cool to see them really dive into that, like take HD2D even to the next level. But then even the turn-based stuff is still questionable when it comes to the idea of selling 10, 15, 20 million copies. We see what these budgets are doing right now. And in some cases, it's incredibly transparent because of that Insomniac leak. And it makes you wonder if that's something that's keeping them from just going full-on turn-based, full-on pixel art. Because while Octopath Traveler would celebrate a million copies sold, people would be in trouble at Square if Final Fantasy 16, for example, capped out at a million copies. That said, I think there is still a middle ground here. And I believe right now, Final Fantasy VII Remake and soon to be Rebirth is kind of figuring it out. They're skating the line between that, between that action and turn-based combat. And I would like to see that sort of be at the forefront for 17, again, just taken to the next level. But what I'd really like to see is them lean more into some of the, just the RPG elements, even if it's a trip back to the sphere grid or with like the, the crystal, kind of grid from uh, 13 or again, the sphere grid from 10 and play off of that even. So it's not even just traditional leveling. And in 16's case, you just kind of threw points into a, just a tree that you had a skill tree and that was kind of it. I don't know, something like that more creative with the sphere grid. I think it'd be a lot of fun to explore once again, but let me know what you would like to see from Final Fantasy 17 down below because I think we still have quite a while to think about it. And in our last bit of news, let's talk about Suicide Squad, Kill the Justice League, and Rocksteady as we got a bit more information for the backstory of this game and 
Kind of what Rocksteady's been doing this whole time, because there have been rumors flying around about a Superman game. Well, Jason Schreier threw some cold water on those rumors. We can see this was posted up by Bloomberg in his article, kind of detailing the, the build up to the release of Suicide Squad, saying, in reality, Rocksteady never pitched or worked on a Superman game. According to people familiar with the company's strategy over the last decade, following the release of Arkham Knight in 2015, the studio began working on a Batman VR game, and then an unannounced multiplayer game set in an original franchise, which has not been previously reported. At the end of 2016, a Suicide Squad game at the Warner Bros. studio in Montreal was canceled, and the property was subsequently given to Rocksteady, which began working on the current iteration in 2017. So there you have it. From 2017 to now, they've been working on Suicide Squad. And it still is really weird to me because I don't, I don't, is Suicide Squad that big of a franchise where you want to have Rocksteady work on it for seven years? I, I guess, again, the live service stuff, they figure the multiplayer aspect would play into having the Suicide Squad with four different members controllable by different people and you level up, you get all kinds of loot and battle passes. But at the end of the day, if you just, I, I still think it's possible to make a good game, sell enough copies and make money and then go on to the next one. I Again, though, with these budgets, maybe it really is becoming that difficult, but if they started in 2017, you can see what happens when you go seven years in development for a live service game. By the time it comes out, as we are seeing now with Suicide Squad, it kind of feels like been there, done that, and they're behind the times even with some of the monetization practices to where they just show up too late and people just aren't really enjoying it. They lifted the NDA on the alpha, the closed alpha they did, and that didn't go over well either. So it's, it's out in a few weeks now. I don't think it's going to do well with reviews. I'd be shocked if it exploded online in terms of player count because I just, outside of the story, I just, I, I don't know if enough is there to grab people and pull them in, especially with something like Suicide Squad, which again, I know there are fans of whether it's the movies or um, the comics or whatever there, there's the intellectual property itself. I just don't know if there's a mainstream audience that's ready to tackle it and be excited about a live service game that could potentially last years and years and years. This might be Rocksteady's last game for quite a while. And in fact, it might be their last game completely with some of the heads of the studio even moving on as we went up to uh, to Suicide Squad's release. But wow, would you have liked to have seen Rocksteady attempt a Superman game? Because I think I'd be much more interested in hearing about that right now than what I've seen with Suicide Squad. And before we go to the comment of the day, we're gonna take a look at the poll that I posted up yesterday. We're asked, how would you like to see Final Fantasy 17 combat handle? It's almost a complete split between full action and full turn base, 23 and 24%. And then the majority of people voting right in the middle there, mix of action and turn base, sort of like Final Fantasy VII Remake. And I will say, right now, I'm incredibly excited for Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Uh, every time they show it, it looks better and better. And it is playing into that action combat with the turn based elements and party commands and all the different interlinked skills that are happening on screen. There's a lot happening, yes, and it is over the top at times, but it just looks fun. So, I mean, yeah, if that, if that works out with Rebirth, yeah, I would, I would love to see them continue to push that along and advance it further and eventually end up at the next big numbered Final Fantasy with like the perfected system between action and turn-based. And we'll finish up with the comment of the day as you're seeing here. This is from Josh who says, I was so impressed when John actually pronounced Neon Genesis Evangelion correctly. Must be that tsunami history. I've actually never watched Neon Genesis Evangelion. I've seen it on... Places like Twitter, just social media in general, when you're scrolling through the different uh, different gifs or clips from the, the show. But what ends up happening with some of these different properties or even names, for the show, I actually look up as best I can how to pronounce some of this stuff. Just some preparation work, I promise, does go into all this. Sometimes I can't find anything about pronunciation. I just wing it. In this case, though, it was pretty easy to find how to pronounce Neon Genesis Evangelion so I can surprise some of the listeners out there. But yeah, Toonami? Yeah, I was I was on board with that one, but uh, I, I mostly stuck with Dragon Ball, Reboot, Gundam Wing. There was a lot of good stuff on there. And ladies and gentlemen, that's gonna do it here for Newswave. If you enjoyed this video, guys, hit that like button. If not, hit the dislike. Leave comments down below about everything we talked about here today. Where's these Switch games apparently going out of stock, out of print, just kind of disappearing. Were you someone who was out there concerned and maybe trying to pick up a bunch of these games? Or are you going to wait it out and see what happens on Nintendo's end? And then also, what about Final Fantasy 17? How would you like to see them tackle that game when it's time 
six years from now. And then Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League is out in a couple weeks. But if you could go back in time and be Warner Bros. for a minute, what game would you have assigned or even talked to Rocksteady about tackling next? Thanks guys for watching and I'll see you next time.